All right, I, I assume you can see everything here. Yes. Okay, so uh, very sorry I couldn't make it. Uh, I was really looking forward to this trip, but I just got back from China and uh, was <laughs> going to be unbearable to get back and strapped into a seat for the the long flights over there. So I'll I'll do my best to give what would be my expected presentations there. Um, I don't quite know the nature of the audience, so feel free to um, ask questions as I go through. I might not be paying attention to the chat, so someone might need to shout out at me. I started out as an ecologist many, many years ago in my career and have sort of made transitions through genetics and then genomics. And past few years, I've been working on uh, connection to cell biology, to evolutionary biology. And, and that's brought me into contact quite a bit with biophysics and bioenergetics. And that's where my talk will be going today. But first, I thought I'd, I'd sort of set the big picture because my, my guess is most of what you've been discussing up to now has been sort of the biochemistry, biophysics sides of, of bioenergetics. And I want to uh, make a connection with evolutionary biology that hasn't often been made before, but I think might be uh, fundamental for, uh, for our understanding of how cellular diversity expands across the tree of life. So the the uh, probably the best way to start is, you know, a problem we have in evolutionary biology, and that is for the vast majority of scientists, there's nothing more to evolution than natural selection. You study diversity of some sort, and then you try and concoct some adaptive stories. Uh, and this is probably best phrased by this iconic quote of Darwin, who I'll remind you, you did write this one famous book called The Origin of the Species, but he wrote 53 other books crossing all, all areas of biology at the time. And I actually like to think of uh, Darwin as the, the first real integrative biologist. And in, and, and in the process of doing all this work, he taught us a bit about natural selection. What he says here is that if feeble man can do much by artificial selection, I can see no limit to the amount of change to the beauty and complexity of co-adaptations and, and so on. And I think that pretty much sums up the way most people out of the field think about evolutionary biology. If it's beautiful and complex, that complexity of beauty must have been driven by natural selection in some sort of way. But although natural selection is the most powerful force in the biological world, it's not all powerful. And what selection can and can't do is dependent on these three sort of triads of different kinds of environments. So at the bottom there, this is what ecologists study mostly. And in fact, what most evolutionary biologists study, things going on outside of organisms, trying to find the appropriate mates, trying to get a hold of the appropriate resources and uh, avoiding bad things like predators and pathogens. But ultimately what selection uh, can and can't do is dictated by what goes on inside of cells. There's problems of historical contingencies that we can't get away from. We all have to use ribosomes and this crazy machine called ATP synthase to make energy. Uh, those were there at the ancestor of all of life. We aren't allowed to break the, the laws of biophysics. And it turns out that molecular stochasticity is a pretty big deal inside cells because some uh, protein coding genes are typically only represented by a handful of molecules at any one point in time. And then there's what I call the population genetic environment, which really dictates how selection can operate. And that has three components, recombination, reassorts variation among chromosomes, a mutation creates variation upon which natural selection acts. And then random genetic drift is, a, is the noise in the evolutionary process. It's a consequence of finite numbers of individuals in populations, and also the fact that our, our genes are tied together uh, covalently on chromosomes, and that leads to interference and makes populations behave genetically as though they're a lot smaller than they actually are. And just to sort of uh, get the big picture here uh, for um, the population genetic environment to emphasize that this really matters, in doing comparative biology, I've outlined how these three components scale with different aspects of, of biology. So on the left, we're looking at how the effective population size of a species scales with the adult dry weight. 
so to the left, we have uh, uh, unicellular species, bacteria and unicellular carryouts. And then we move, uh, I guess, 21 orders of magnitude to the right, and we're getting into big metazoans and land plants. And there's this nice scaling here of uh, about a minus one fifth power law scaling. In the middle, we're looking at how mutation rates scale with the effective population size. I'll return to this in just a second. But the main point here is that things with large effective population sizes, which have small adult dry weights, these are microbes down here, have lower mutation rates than do big multicellular organisms. I guess I could use a pointer. Let me um, see if I can figure out how to use a pointer. Does anyone, can anyone give me advice on how to do that? Uh, Mike, right now we are able to see your, your cursor. Oh, you can see my pointer. Yes, we can. Per perfect. Okay. And then over to the right, uh, we're looking at uh, the relationship between the recombination rate per physical distance and genome size. And, we, and again, there's this minus one power law scaling. As you move to the right, you're getting the larger and larger genomes. And the... Uh, recombination rate going on is, is uh, declining uh, inversely proportional to genome size. There's a simple reason for this. Uh, there's one genetic constraint on all eukaryotes is that there's typically just one crossover per chromosome arm. And as organisms get larger and larger genomes, they're just in getting larger and larger chromosomes. It's not that much due to changes in chromosome number. So if you double the genome size, you reduce the amount of recombination by 50%. So all of these things are changing dramatically by orders of magnitude across the tree of life. And that dictates how evolution can and can't occur in different lineages. So we've been trying to take these general ideas from population genetics into developing this new field that we call evolutionary cell biology. And it's a strange situation we have in evolution at this point. We have really mature fields of molecular evolution, genome evolution, some would say evolutionary developmental biology, but we jumped right over the cell. There is no cohesive theory or comprehensive theory uh, to help us understand how evol occur evolution occurs at the cellular level. And yet almost all organisms on the planet are unicellular in nature. This is just a set of diverse uh, ciliate cells showing you know, their diversity in morphologies and internal structures and so on. And Wilson summed it up quite nicely about a hundred years ago, uh, why we should be paying attention to the cell. The key to every biological problem must be sought in the cell for every living organism is, or at one time has been a cell, sort of a no brainer. The uh, copy of his book up here, you probably can't see it, uh, but the publisher there is a forgotten books. So that somewhat says it all. There'll be another new book. I hope it's not forgotten immediately. This will be coming out. Uh, was supposed to be out this October and it will be uh, coming out, I guess, in February or so with Oxford if the copy editor doesn't completely destroy it. This is a sequel of an earlier book I wrote on the origins of genome architecture. And I'm pointing this out because the the chapters of this book are all uh, available as PDFs right now at this website down below. And I guess you'll all have access to these slides. Uh, we have teaching materials associated with all the chapters in the book, uh, including past lectures that I've given and PowerPoint slides. So anybody's free to lift these if they'd like to start teaching this course at your own university. Today's lecture will be partly uh, drawn from chapter nine in the book about evolutionary scaling laws in cell biology, primarily focused on bioenergetic sort of issues. And then tomorrow I'll be talking about uh, what the bioenergetic cost of uh, various internal and external parts of cells and the cost of operating them are and why that becomes important for understanding evolutionary cell biology. An organizing principle here associated with the population genetic principles that I just gave is what I call the drift barrier hypothesis. So here the idea is that we expect to find gradients in the mean phenotypes of species for traits that are under identical selection in all lineages uh, 
these should simply arise if these lineages have different effective population sizes. So let's imagine some trait, maybe growth efficiency, to put this in context of this particular uh, program. And selection is always uh, trying to improve your ability to take uh, carbon compounds from nature and uh, convert them into biomass. So you can imagine now selections pushing you in an upward direction. You're not allowed to cross this level of molecular perfection. This was what with the limits of biophysics would be. Uh, but at smaller and smaller population sizes, you can see that the efficiency of, of selection is, is being reduced relative to what it is over here. And that's because it's being overwhelmed by the power of random genetic drift, the noise in the evolutionary process. And this relationship between trait performance and effective population size is what we call the drift barrier. So that's the limits to natural selection defined by the prevailing effective population size of a species. And so another way to think about this is if you were to go in and sample each one of these populations, say repeatedly every thousand generations or so and measure the mean phenotype and collect these data for uh, a few million years or so, you would get a frequency distribution of the trait over time for that species. And those are sort of illustrated here in just this cartoon fashion. So over here to the right, we see that the, the mean phenotypes at a very high level with very little variance. And as we move to the left, we're going to smaller and smaller effective population sizes and the mean declines and the, the noise uh, also increases. But that's sort of what we expect to see uh, if this drift area hypothesis is correct. And uh, another way to think about this in a more dynamic sort of way is uh, this drift area is sort of a, a soft gray area in the middle. And suppose selection is operating to re reduce the trait. And here the trait is just the error rate, say, and the mutation rate. But this could be anything. And good is having a really low value here. Um, and so we start up here in a really bad situation. The population wanders down over time. Selection is pulling it into this, this gray area. It's reducing the error rate. Uh, but not below this gray area. Here we start in the gray area. There's drift around the drift areas, essentially, I'm saying we remain there forevermore. Now, here we start out in a great situation, but because of the, the overwhelming power of drift, natural selection is not able to keep us quite down at that level of refinement, and you eventually work your way back up into this. So this is sort of a an example of a a semi-stable equilibrium. There's an absorbing state here that you get to no matter where you start with over time as a consequence of recurrent production of good alleles and bad alleles, selection promoting the good. And just as one, uh, it, well, to, to bring home why this becomes important for what I'll be saying about bioenergetics in a few minutes, Let's return to this plot here of effective population size versus the size of an organism. There's a minus one fifth power law scaling. So big things down here have low effective population sizes. And bacteria get up to effective sizes of only about a billion individuals, which is a very, very tiny number, a tiny pile of bacterial cells, of course. But uh, the point I want to make is that the head count, the census count in the population is only vaguely related to the effective population size. Most of random genetic drift is a consequence of our genes being tied together on chromosomes, which causes selective interference. And that prevents NE from getting much bigger than about a billion individuals in any species. So why is this important for selection? Well, if you're down here, if you have an effective size of 10 to the fourth, which is typical for a lot of mammalian species, the power of drift is now 10 to the minus fourth. It's the reciprocal of the effective population size. Now, if a, select, a gene has a selective advantage that's smaller than 10 to the minus fourth, drift wins and selection can't promote that allele. If a deleterious mutation has a deleterious disadvantage less than 10 to the minus four, selection can't eradicate it from the population that will accumulate in the genome over time. On the other hand, 
if you happen to be a bacterium and live up here and your effective size is 10 to the ninth, then all mutations with absolute effects are greater than 10 to minus nine are visible to selection. So in microbes, selection can be very more fine-tuned in a sense compared to more coarse-grained evolution that we expect down here in big multicellular species. So there has to be a drift barrier. The only way there couldn't be a drift barrier uh, relating mean phenotypes to organism size would be if all mutations had effects less than 10 to the minus nine, that would be a bleak situation because selection couldn't do anything. We wouldn't be here talking about these things today. Or if all mutations had effect greater than 10 to the minus four selection coefficient, which we know not to be true from many, many indirect and direct studies of mutations in the lab. So we know there's going to be a drift barrier. And the only question is, what is the form? What form does this take for different traits across different lineages? The most famous example of this that we've got to date uh, has to do with the mutation rate. I've already shown you some of these data, but no matter what group you look at, uh, the larger the effective population size, the lower the mutation uh, size. So, you know, over about uh, what, six orders of magnitude of effective population size, the uh, mutation rate per nucleotide site per generation declines uh, by almost six orders of magnitude. Uh, so we have this negative association, organisms of large effective population sizes, selection is able to efficiently uh, reduce the mutation rate. Uh, but I also want to emphasize there's still a lot of noise around these general patterns, and that's consistent with that, those plots, those bell-shaped curves I was showing you before. There's drift around the drift barrier. And this last point, I think I'll just skip over, but you may notice uh, that Unicell, well, I'll just mention unicellular eukaryotes. This is one of the few things that maybe the only thing I know of that unicellular eukaryotes do better than bacteria do up here. They have lower mutation rates given the same effective size. The reason for that is that bacteria have larger number of protein coding genes in their genome, and there's more ways to break a, bac uh, a unicellular eukaryote cell than a, a bacterial cell, and that reinforces selection for lower mutation rates. And once you account for that, everything lines up nicely. The total number of deleterious mutations arising per genome scales about uh, with the inverse of effective population size. And so now we're gonna move on to bioenergetics but uh, and maybe some biophysics sort of arguments. But I wanna emphasize here, a common biophysics argument is that there's a trade-off between speed and efficiency of traits but that doesn't uh, explain the data here because here we have bacteria, unicellular eukaryotes. They have the highest rates of cell division, and yet they have a much, much lower mutation rate. They're much more accurate in replicating their DNA than us vertebrates and land plants are. Mike? Uh, yeah. I have a question here. Sure. So um, here, things like uh, error correction processes, there are mechanisms as animals, uh, organisms are getting bigger, et cetera, to error correct and all of this, right? Which may not exist in uni, uh, bacteria and so on. So does this take into account such mechanisms or this is simply the uh, basal mutation rate that one is talking about? This is the total cumulative mutation rate as a consequence of everything that's involved in uh, error surveillance at the DNA level. And yeah, the the uh, there, there's three sort of uh, layers of surveillance for mutations in in all organisms. They're pretty much the same in bacteria and in eukaryotes. So there's a you start with the DNA polymerase, and that tries to load in the the right Watson Crick match, so a, an A versus a T or a C across from a G, and the polymerase itself makes a lot of errors and then but the polymerase has a proofreading domain and that's true in both prokaryotes and eukaryotes and then finally there's this uh, pathway called the mismatch repair pathway and that catches errors that even the proofreading domain so this isn't microsoft spell checker the proofreading domain you know makes some errors and those are picked up by mismatch repair which itself isn't perfect 
there are some bacteria that don't have mismatch repair and yet they have normal mutation rates. So it looks like selection operates on the total package uh, to reduce the mutation rate to a particular level. So there's there seems to be um, excess capacity, so to speak, in the system. If you eliminate one of these layers, the other ones pick up the slack, so to speak. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah, thanks. All right, so now, now we're gonna move on. I've sort of hopefully set the table and where we're heading from an evolutionary perspective. And now we wanna think about scaling laws. And can you, are you able to see the top um, yeah, label no for my slides? Yes, yes, no problem. Okay, at all. they're blocked on my own computer. So as long as you can see them. So I wanna think about scaling laws in uh, uh, pat phylogenetic patterns and bioenergetics. And so one question here is, are there bioenergetic features of cells that scale with cell size independent of phylogenetic infinity, affinity? So are there general scaling relationships for bioenergetics across the tree of life? And if this occurs, we wanna know what, what are the physical biological determinants of the, the quantitative features of scaling and what constrains evolutionary diversification. If there's scaling laws, that implies that species aren't able to drift too far from the general scaling relationships. And another question of great interest, I won't talk about it too much today, but there, as we'll see in a minute, um, there's different scaling laws at different levels of biology. I'll be mainly talking about scaling laws at the phylogenetic level. By that, I mean uh, differences between species. But of course, within species, uh, individuals grow, you know, from birth to adult, and uh, there can be also variation within species. So there's different kinds of scaling laws, perhaps, for the with differences within of individuals within species, or just different developmental stages uh, within species as well. And we would like to eventually know: Are these scaling relationships parallel to those at the phylogenetic level? So just to remind you, cells come in quite a few different sizes. So these are some, uh, here's bacteria down here, and then I've got the full range, the mean, and I think the uh, standard deviation of cell volume uh, for unicellular eukaryotes up here. And you can see in general, there's a lot of overlap between phylogenetic groups and a lot of variation within groups. We'll make use of this with ciliates in a few minutes. Uh, but just within well-known uh, unicellular species, there's about 11 orders of magnitude difference. If you add multicellular species, now we're adding another 10 orders of magnitude of size at maturity. So now we're up to 21 orders of magnitude difference in the size of individuals across the tree of life. There are a few exceptions. There seem to be no fundamental limits to the size of prokaryotic organisms or even eukaryotic cells. So, well, I, there are some limits, but this takes us beyond the, the barriers that I, I just mentioned. So there's a thing called Thiomargarita magnifica that it grows in sort of man areas near mangrove swamps. This is a bacterium, lives on the sediments. Uh, cells can be up to two centimeters in length. To the right is a marine green alga called Calerpa. And this is a single cell, a multinucleate cell, up to meters in length. So it sort of, you know, uh, expands our view of, you know, the size range that is possible with a single cell sort of situation. But I'll be talking for the rest of the, today about the uh, things that are more confined to the ranges I just showed. Now, when we think about scaling relationships, Generally, uh, we like to, to uh, consider what we call allometric scaling relationships. And biologists and physicists like to call these laws, although we, I guess we could debate to the cows come home on what we mean by laws. These are also called power functions. And uh, the simple mathematical relationship here is uh, our, our uh, dependent variable on the y-axis, z here is some function of S here, the X axis variable. S would be size uh, and everything we'll be talking about today. But 
It could be the length of the organism, the mass of the organism, or the volume. I'll be talking about generally three-dimensional sort of measures, so volume or mass. And you can see this is a power law relationship. There's a normalization constant out front. That's the expected value of Z if S is equal to one. And then beta here is the scaling coefficient. That tells us how Z changes proportionally with respect to size as size increases. And uh, the nice thing about this kind of relationship is, well, one, it seems uh, for whatever reason to fit many, many biological uh, relationships uh, quite well. But statistically, this is also a, a nice way to describe things because if you take the log transform of this, now you've got the log of Z is equal to the log of alpha plus beta log of S. So that means we can just use a normal uh, least squares linear regression to fit the log of A, the intercept, and beta, the slope, to get the key parameters of this uh, allometric power, power law function. So with this kind of formulation, if beta is equal to one, that implies isometric growth, direct proportionality between Z and S. And if beta is greater than one, it means that Z grows at a high, hypermetrically with respect to size. And if it's less than one, it grows more slowly than size. Physicists get very excited when these, uh, and biologists too, uh, when the slopes of these kinds of relationships are proportional in some way to one third, two thirds, or three thirds equals one, uh, because uh, these three digits here are associated with linear, one-dimensional, surface, two-dimensional, or volumetric, three-dimensional measures of the cell. And so there's been a lot of debate in the literature about, you know, for these various things that I'll show you, are the, are the slopes one-thirds or two-thirds or three-thirds? And there's also been a lot of recent debate about fractals and now, now oh boy, are they scaling with a three-quarters power law relationship and so on. But the main point here is you can sort of use laws from uh, sort of mathematical relationships from uh, physics or just basic geometry to infer what these slopes might be under certain conditions. So there's three kinds of allometry that I've already alluded to. Uh, there's developmental allometry. This would just be the trajectories of, of a trait within individual through development. How does your brain size or head size change as you grow from birth to uh, maturity? There's intraspecific allometry. This would be uh, the scaling relationship between different individuals within a species at the same developmental stages. So head size of different people in the room there with respect to their stature or something like that. You will reach maturity, I, I guess. Uh, and then uh, phylogenetic or evolutionary allometry, which is mostly what I'll be focused on today. And that's how does the, how do the mean phenotypes of traits X and Y relate among species? This is one of the most famous scaling relationships that's been around. It connects directly with bioenergetics. What I've plotted here are just some data. I guess mostly these were, well, I, I guess I've harvested a lot of these data, but a lot of these were published in a paper by John DeLong quite a few years ago. This is the relationship between the metabolic rate measured as nanoliters of oxygen consumed by a cell per day as a function of the dry weight of a cell and there's two uh, sets of data here. The blue points are for bacteria, and the dark red are for unicellular eukaryotes. And you'll notice that, you know, roughly a straight line can be fit through these data. But if you, you take a look at each set of data points together, the slope for the bacteria, and there are many more data now for this, the slope is uh, hypermetric, so beta is equal to 1.3. Metabolic rate is increasing at an increasing rate with, with cell volume. 
Whereas for unicellular eukaryotes, it's almost isometric. The, the slope is almost exactly one. What I haven't shown here is what happens when you get into multicellular species. And if you can just follow my pointer, what will happen when you get into larger and larger organisms, this starts to taper off. The slope is, is uh, much less than one, somewhere between uh, three quarters and uh, uh, two thirds conveniently. Uh, providing nice fodder for arguments between people who like the one quarter versus one third scaling relationships. The main point here is not surprisingly, metabolic rate increases with the size of the organism. There's more biomass to support, but it does it in a decreasing manner through time. Although the overall pattern looks almost continuous as you go from group to group. So, when biologists find scaling relationships like this, we try to understand why they exist. One possibility is that these relationships are just inevitable outcomes of biophysical, biochemical limitations, things like surface to volume uh, ratio sorts of issues. Another possibility is that natural selection has molded organisms so that they need specific combinations of these two traits to have high fitness and that leaves these traits, these bivariate relationships, hugging these straight lines. A third possible. Yeah, a question. Sure. So the, um, I'm always wondering how these metabolic rates are calculated. Could you tell us something about that? Sure. Yeah. And maybe other people can jump in depending on who's in the room. Um, generally, um, the way this would be done is that you would uh, grow your bugs. I mean, the simplest way to do it is to grow your bugs in a uh, on some inert substance, if anything. That well, you can do it two ways. Um, well, bacteria, it's easy. They're growing on a defined medium, right? And you have a certain number of cells in a bottle. You stop the bottle, you measure the oxygen in the bottle at time zero, and then you measure the oxygen at, you know, some hour later or something. And then you know how much oxygen has been consumed uh, per cell during that period of time. If you do this with a heterotrophic organism that's uh, consuming a food that's consuming oxygen itself, then you need to do a control for the baseline oxygen consumption of the food in the container. But that's generally the, the basic approach that's taken here. There's, there's many other approaches. Uh, some people have tried to measure uh, heat production and then relate that back to oxygen production. And I like to use oxygen consumption for a reason I'll, I'll show a few slides down. Does that, uh, other people have measured CO2 production. So you you not only, when you're respiring, you not only consume oxygen, but you uh, uh, let off CO2. So there, there are various ways to do this. And how agnostic is that uh, regarding to their metabolism? Oh, well, that's, that's a good question. <laughs> This is, uh, I guess, what you would call metabolic rate is an emergent property, right? It's it's simply telling us how much oxygen is being consumed. It's not really telling us what's going on in terms of at all in terms of metabolic pathways and so on inside the organism. It's also not really telling us much about the biology of the organism. It tells us you're consuming food and uh, reducing it to something, but it doesn't tell us how, how much is going into biomass production and so on. And I will return to that in a couple of slides. Thank you. Anything else at this point? Okay, so the third possibility here is that these relationships are in some way dictated by uh, the population genetic environment. Are these in some way related to a the kinds of drift barriers that I was pointing out. What's worth pointing out here is for these microbes, however, that you can see these slopes, 1.3 and 1. There's been big debates in the literature about scaling and metabolic rate and growth rate and so on. 
uh, with organism size. And the debates are always as to whether there's a two thirds or three quarter power law scaling. And you can see the data are really inconsistent with, you, you get something in this vicinity, usually it's between two thirds and three fourths, which makes for a great debate. You know, there's statistical noise here, but you can see that we're not even close to that when we get into unicellular organisms. So we need some other explanations for these scaling relationships. And I'm not saying we're there yet. I'm just pointing this out as a challenge for the field. But what's interesting to ponder as well, and I'll get back to this in a few minutes, is why is there a different scaling between prokaryotes and eukaryotes? They're, of course, very different cells. Eukaryotic cells have all kinds of internal infrastructure, uh, internal membranes, you know, the nuclear membrane, vesicle transport system, the Golgi, mitochondria, and so on. So does that have anything to do with driving these kind of scaling relationships? And as I just pointed out in response to the last question, it's pretty easy to measure the metabolic rate of an organism, uh, but it's unclear what metabolic rate really measures and how we link that to questions of uh, growth efficiency and so on and how we relate metabolic rate to natural selection and the refinement of organisms. So uh, moving on, uh, I guess you can read my title. I can't read my own title. So, let, oh, here we go. Cellular, connecting cellular bioenergetics with evolutionary theory. So one key goal here is to compute the energetic cost of building entire cells. That's what I'll be focusing on mostly today. How much does it cost energetically in terms of ATP equivalents uh, to build and to operate cells and all their constituent parts. We'll be agnostic as to the parts. We wanna know the total cost of building a cell and how does that relate to cell volume? Oh, hang on a second. I think my, oh, there we go. And then secondly, uh, this will relate to my talk tomorrow. We, we would like to know, we would like to do a, a, a cell's total energy budget we would like to know, for example, what fraction of a cell's energy budget is, is uh, allocated to locomotion, you know, building flagella and the energy of swimming. What fraction of the energy budget's going into different kinds of internal membranes like mitochondrial membranes and so on. Uh, the reason for wanting to know these two things, well, first to get the fractional contribution to a cell's energy budget, we need to know the total cell's energy budget. That will be the topic of today's talk. And once we know the fractional uh, investment, we get some idea of how easy it is to go down certain evolutionary pathways. And we also know how vulnerable a trait would be to loss. Uh, so for example, if it costs a lot to swim and to make the, the swimming apparatus, if you suddenly found yourself in an environment where swimming's not doing you any good uh, because of the huge investment uh, in the swimming apparatus, that trait would be one of the first ones to go, you would expect, because then that would release uh, the other parts of your energy budget to growth. So uh, what about this cost of, of building a cell? How can we measure the, the cost of building a cell? Well, this field started in the field of microbial uh, physiology, some, oh, uh, 80 years ago or so, um, people started growing uh, certain bacterial species and, and a few things, unicellular things like yeast, in a defined medium in a flow-through container. This is called a chemostat. And it's a really elegant way to grow things in a controlled way. So imagine you have a, an organism that can be grown on, grown on a defined medium. And by defined medium, I mean it's completely, there's no other organisms in here. It's completely consisting of a carbon source that will be needed to build carbon skeletons and also to extract energy. And then there's all kinds of uh, nutrients in here. And you, you can put anything you want in here. Uh, your goal is to try and understand the growth rate of your organism given this nutritional environment. 
And then this flows into this container here. This is the chemostat. It's usually bubbled to keep thing, your cells suspended. So there's an air supply here. And then there's an overflow. And there's a spigot here that, re, that controls the rate at which uh, medium is flowing in and they're flowing in and flowing out the same rate. And that keeps this a steady state. So there's a dilution rate here. And the way this works is this system will quickly reach an equilibrium cell density. And by definition, the dilution rate, the rate of, because it's at an equilibrium, the rate of growth of cells must equal the rate of loss of cells by dilution. So you can set a chemostat uh, for any growth rate. If you, you slow down the flow rate, you're going to slow down the steady state growth rate. If you increase the flow rate, uh, you'll increase the steady state growth rate. If you increase the flow rate too much, the cells can't are biologically capable of keeping up and eventually you'll just wash out the system. But when you do this kind of work, you learn really quickly how, how far you can go. But the beauty of this system is you can control your bug to be growing at a steady state, long-term rate of growth. You can really control the rate of growth. And then what you can do Hang on, I'm uh, pushing my slide advance and it's not going anywhere. Things are frozen up. Let me try one other thing. Now is a good time for questions, I guess. If there are any questions. I think I'll get out of uh, screen sharing and go back in and see if I can reboot this. Just give me a second. Okay. Okay, back in business. So what you can do with a system like this is you can grow your bug at different flow rates, different dilution rates. So that's easy to do. You know the concentration. Let's say you're growing things on a, a, a defined medium in which glucose is the sole source of energy and carbon. You know the concentration of glucose here. You know the concentration coming out here, usually it's close to zero. So you know the difference between the input and the output. You know how many cells are in here and you know the flow rate. So from all this information, you can calculate the resource consumption rate, say in this case, grams of glucose per grams of cells or numbers of cells per unit time. So now for every one of these flow rates, you know the consumption rate per cell per unit time. And at the low dilution rates, um, the consumption rate is, is down here. And as we go to higher dilution rates, higher growth rates, the consumption rate goes up. So down here, the cells are approaching starvation. And generally when people do this, they get these almost always get something very, very close to a straight line in the relationship. There's noise in estimation. That's why all the dots aren't exactly on the straight line. You do a linear regression here. You get a slope and you get an intercept, and these have a real meaning. So the slope here, you're plotting resource consumption per unit time, and you're plotting that against cell division per unit time. So the slope is the resource required to build a new cell. So that's a neat way you can estimate uh, the amount of number of glucose molecules, for example, it takes to build a new cell. Then if you know something about the biology of your organism, for example, the pathway that glucose goes down, say down the glycolytic pathway into the citric acid cycle, you can convert glucose, uh, molecules of glucose consumed to molecules of ATP produced. And that's generally what people did uh, in the old days in microbial physiology. Then the other thing you can get, of course, from a linear regression, you get an intercept. And that intercept is usually interpreted as the baseline uh, cell requirements in terms of energy. 
here you're you're extrapolating of course a little bit but the implication here is that's the amount of energy it just it takes just to stay alive but not there's no energy left over to grow so you can get these two parameters from this kind of uh plot here which has become known as the pert plot after uh the gentleman who first started doing this work Mike? and so using this kind of approach you can get the number of ATPs it takes to build a cell, and then we'll be looking at this at different, of cells of different sizes. Is there a question? Yeah, yeah there's yeah. a question. There's a, there are a couple of questions. Okay. I was wondering whether the slope would change significantly for different uh, nutrient condition and different temperatures. Yeah, that's a good question. I, I failed to mention this. So people often do this well, these aren't done so much anymore, but instead of glucose, you could use like methanol or, you know, some other carbon source. Uh, when you do that, you, you still get these kind of straight line relationships. Then you get the amount of methanol or whatever your carbon source is, uh, glycerol, number of those molecules consumed. And then what folks do is if you know enough about the metabolic pathways of your organism, you can convert glycerol or methanol or whatever it is into ATP equivalents as well. And when you do that, you generally get the same answer for ATPs to build a cell. You get a unifying answer across different carbon sources, I guess is what I'm saying. Make sense? Uh Mike, I have another question, which is a bit more practical. So uh, how do you measure the y-axis? So I understand if you have a chemostat, you can control the dilution rate. But then uh, yep. how it, I, I guess the problem will be that you inject glucose, but there will be also part of the glucose, glucose maybe is not consumed and, and will be expelled, right? So how Yeah, so roughly speaking, uh, you, you think about the, this is high concentration, this is low concentration. So the difference is what's being consumed. And you know the amount of time separating the two and the volume and the number of cells. And so from that, you, you know how much glucose is being squeezed out per unit time to get the concentration down here. And you know the number of cells. So you divide that by the number of cells. I'm not sure I understood. Can can you please re rephrase? <laughs> okay, let's make it simple. Let's suppose that there's no glucose down here. The cells are so good that all the glucose is consumed in here. And it, it often that's roughly a pretty good approximation. So you know the rate at which glucose is going in. Right? You know the flow rate. You know the total number of glucose molecules coming in per unit time. It's all being consumed. Okay, and in that case, it's linear by construction, right? Yeah. And you know the number of cells, so you know the consumption rate per cell. Okay. Okay, thanks. So that's the general approach. Now, there is a little worry uh, sometimes that this intercept isn't quite the baseline cell uh, maintenance because one might argue that basic maintenance costs of cells might change as uh, cells grow at a higher and higher rate. Um, and, you know, cells might start to enter dormancy and so on. But so the, I guess the best way to think about this intercept is it's an extrapolation from actively growing cells. Any other questions at this point? Okay, so this is, oh, go ahead. Thank you. Um, so my question is, if I go to, if I go to really low dilution rates, right, the, the cell concentration will get very high. Um, and so I wonder whether a, another kind of compounding factor um, for the interpretation of the intercept can be that as cell concentrations get high, you expect them to actively compete maybe so that, right, you, might expect to have more energy 
use um, that's maybe unproductive waste because cells somehow start to fight for resources. Yeah, that's a possibility. Uh, but if something like that's going on in any pronounced way, then you'd expect to get a non-linearity in this sort of relationship and generally they look pretty linear. But you're right, when you have a very, very uh, low dilution rate, the densities do get very, very high. And that's why the, the cells start starving. Thanks. Okay, so that's the approach to uh, getting the cost of building a cell. And now this next plot here tells us, um, this summarizes data from uh, studies of this sort for quite a few different species. So the slopes, remember, gives us gives us the growth rate, the number of ATP molecules, billion of ATPs required to build a cell. And we're looking at, at different species. Each point's a different species with a different cell volume. The black points here are for bacteria. The blue points are for unicellular eukaryotes. So yeast is in here someplace. And this is a, I believe this is tetrahymen, ciliated protozoan. These red points are cells from multicellular species. Uh, they're things like HeLa cells and carrot cells. They're sort of having out-of-body experiences, but I thought I'd throw those in there anyhow, uh, just to show you that they also fall close to this line. And this line is also almost isometric. You see that the, the exponent here is very, very close to 1.00. So that means across all these different cells, the number of ATP molecules it takes to build a cell is ATP equivalence is pretty much proportional to cell volume. So that's uh, one thing to learn from this. The other thing is that this scaling is continuous across between bacteria and unicellular eukaryotes, despite the fact that cell structures are very, very different in prokaryotes than in eukaryotes. Just as the, an example, an E. coli cell is roughly a, uh, a cubic uh, micron in, in volume, and it you just read this off. It takes about three times 10 to the 10th ATP hydrolysis equivalents to build an E. coli cell. The point here is you can use this relationship uh, extend it to cells of different sizes and different organisms, given its apparent universality, to get at least a crude estimate of how much it costs to build your organism. What's less clear is what dictates the slopes and the intercepts of these functions. So these are statistical relationships. Um, this is the, the cell maintenance cost. This is the maintenance per hour in terms of ATPs. And it's also, a, it's pretty close to isometric. Uh, these rates are, are much lower. So actively growing cells, almost all of the cell energy budget, which is the total growth times the metabolic rate times the cell division time, almost all of this a cell's energy budget is going into this and not uh, metabolism. But if you start starving organism, organisms, T goes up and up and up and eventually you get to the point where almost all of the slowly growing cells energy budgets just going into maintenance. So we have these nice statistical relationships. It gives us a start of trying to understand at least how much it costs to make biomass. It doesn't give us a time element yet, which I'll get into in a second. But one limitation of this approach is that it can only be applied to organisms that you can grow in a defined medium because you need to know your carbon energy source, it's the same molecule, and you need to know how to convert that down biochemical pathways. But many organisms, such as the ciliates here, they grow on other, by eating other organisms, bacteria, algae in some cases, and so on. That, that makes this, this general approach much more difficult because at the minimum, you would need a two-tiered chemostat. You would have to grow your food on a defined medium first, as in the previous example, and then that would have to flow into your culture of your paramecium, your tetrahymen, and so on. That's a lot of work and no guarantee you're not gonna come up with some serious contamination problems and so on. So we tried to think of an alternative way to uh, estimate the cost of building cells. 
in organisms that are heterotrophs and require you know, live organism diet. Now, just to give you an idea how you can do this, uh, we have enough data for ciliated protozoans to, to do this. So this diagram you've seen before, these are some of the diverse forms of, of cells that you find in ciliated protozoans. There's almost a five order of magnitude range of variation in cell size in ciliates. And there's a lot of measures of growth rates in cilia. So what we're looking at here is the cell division rate. Every point's a different cilia species. So this one out here would probably be stentor up here, this big goblet-shaped thing. And you can see that it declines slowly. And we'll see more data like this in a few minutes. Declines slowly with an increase in cell size. So bigger cells take longer time to divide. No chemostats or anything involved in this. is just natural measures of maximum cell division rates. People have also measured metabolic rates, the number of oxygen molecules consumed per day in many of these species. And then there's the elementric scaling relationship here. That's going uphill with increasing size of the organism. Not surprising because larger organisms, you're subsidizing uh, more biomass. Now there's a neat trick you can play here. We know how much oxygen is consumed for cells of different size uh, per day, and we know the rate of biomass production per day. So we have the metabolic rate and we have the cell uh, division rate. So the ratio of these two is the number of oxygen molecules consumed per cell division. So it's the same kind of thing we've been after before, but in this case, it's the number of oxygen molecules consumed uh, not directly a measure of, of carbon substrate. The problem here, if you've got these organisms eating other organisms which are made up of all different kinds of carbon molecules. So we have to start with something more general like oxygen. Now there's a lot been a lot of work done in biochemistry and lots of different organisms. And there's this thing called the, the PO ratio. That's the number of ATPs typically produced per oxygen atom consumed. As I said, this has been measured in a lot of organisms, and it's typically pretty close to 2.5. So there's two oxygen atoms and an oxygen an O2 molecule. So if we multiply five times this ratio here, we have an estimate of the number of ATP hydrolyses per cell division used in. ATP production. And then uh, we have to make one more assumption. When organisms consume carbon molecules, part of it's going into uh, making energy and part of it's going into making carbon skeletons, making more biomass. Rough estimates in a lot of organisms is about half of the material the organic material going into organisms goes to carbon skeletons, the other half going into uh, ATP production. So now we'll multiply this 5 MR by 2 to account for the total number of ATP equivalents. And when we get done with all of this, we get this scaling relationship here using the ratio of this to this and multiplying by 10. This is in units of 10 to the ninth ATPs. And this is the previous relationship we had from the PERT plot approach. So again, the exponent is quite high here. Uh, the standard errors are pretty big, so they're pretty close to is isometry. This one has a scale, uh, a normalization constant that's about four times the size of this. For some of our purposes, uh, we're going to be happy to be uh, within you know a factor of. of of four of each of these particular measurements for the kind of comparative analysis I'm going to present. Why this might be higher uh, is unclear. Some of this is just statistical noise. We have to be worried about that. But maybe, uh, you know, only a quarter of your energy goes into carbon skeletons and only a, maybe this is not 2.5, but 1.25. And then we got a factor of four and we're right back down to here. So there's a lot of uncertainties, but I think you still get the general message that this, this is a useful approach for a set of organisms that you might be interested in that you just can't uh, maintain in a sort of chemostat environment. I have a question. Yeah. 
So in the graph where you were showing that uh, the cellular volume and the ATP that it consumes uh, are it relates to each other directly proportional. The previous one, the, I think the previous. Graph. Yeah. So in this graph, I wanted to understand this cellular volume uh, correlate to cellular complexity in a direct manner. As in, is it just the volume of the cell or it is how complex the cell is in terms of its genetic material and the genes or the DNA, you know, giving rise to the number of proteins, which makes the cell per se uh, enough complex as a result of which it requires the increased amount of ATP to survive. Yeah, and that's the point I'm trying to make here is, uh, so these are just pure cell volume. They're agnostic with respect to what's inside the cell. So, you know, you're just using, you know, geometric volume equations. You know, a lot of bacteria are rod shaped, right. close to a cylinder, others are round and so on. So this is just total cell volume. And that's what's interesting, the point you're raising is these are much simpler cells, bacterial cells, than these eukaryotic cells up here, which mm -hmm. have all kinds of internal structures, and yet they seem to follow the same scaling relationship. So it's interesting that a very dramatic change in cell structure mm -hmm. doesn't really translate into differences in um, the total, into the energy required to build a cell. So many more lipids in eukaryotic cells because of all the internal membranes, uh, for example. So I, I guess I didn't answer your question because I don't strictly know the answer, but um, why this occurs, but uh, the cell volumes are, are completely agnostic with respect to what's going on inside the cell. Okay. So I have a follow-up question to that. So it's it has a developmental uh, aspect to it. So we know that when the embryo starts growing, I mean, it uh, divides and reaches a particular cell stage, it, the volume is maintained. And after that, the it increases in size and then gives rise to a multicellular organism per se. So uh, when it is just dividing in number, I mean, cells are dividing in number, but the volume remains constant for an embryo. Uh, at that stage, is there any volume to metabolic uh, state ratio maintained as a result of which the minimum size that the cell can achieve is basically has a metabolic limit to it. And hence, after that stage itself, it can increase in size and then give rise to a multicellular organism. But that switch from where the embryo does not increase in volume, but just increases in cell number and maintains a particular volume. And from there, when it, uh, you know, in shoots up and gives rise to an organism, is there a metabolic limit to it? Probably ATP, and that relates to a particular cell volume. Uh, is there any relation like that? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, I mean, there is metabolism going on then, um, but it wouldn't be due to cell growth. Uh, so that would be uh, something interesting to look at. And I think... There may be some folks in the room who worked on this kind of thing, uh, for example, um, with respect to the cell cycle and the energy, energetic cost of various phases of the cell cycle. I'll try and return to this in a, a little bit when I talk about a bit on multicellular species, but I'm not going to say too much about it. But in case I forget, what I, I will say is that... Um, well, we study a microcrustacean called Daphne, and I'll show you a little bit about this in a while. And you can measure the energetic uh, cost of growth. It'd be related to this kind of thing here. You can you can calculate um, M over R at different life stages. And uh, those values are much lower earlier in life. So the, the point is that growth efficiency is, is much more efficient earlier when organisms are small and declines as they get larger and larger, probably because they're supporting a you know bigger sort of cellular uh, organismal infrastructure. Right. Okay. Thank you. Um, Mike? <clears throat> yeah. Um, you mentioned this uh, split of energy consumption with carbon skeleton and something else in the cell. Do you have any insight on how that might change with size or if that ratio is a constant with uh, volume? 
Yeah, um, that's a good question. I, I, I can't give you a good answer on that. I've I've looked around on that. There, there's lots and lots of this work that's done in various ecology labs and so on. Um, people measure a, what they call assimilation efficiency. And this has been done in lots of planktonic organisms, zooplankton uh, in particular. Um, it's hard to make comparisons because the studies are done in all sorts of different ways with all sorts of different foods and it becomes hard to know whether the assimilation efficiencies are due to the consumer differences are due to the consumer differences or the food differences. So I, I guess I can't give you a really accurate answer, but I think that's the kind of thing that needs to be done in the future. Thank you. Okay, are we ready for the next slide? Okay, so what I just gave you is a series of relationships between the amount of energy it takes to build a cell and cell volume. But what is missing there is the time dimension. I haven't said anything about the rip the time it takes to build a new cell. And ultimately that's what natural selection is about. It's the growth rate of full cells. It's not just about the total energy to make a new baby. It's about how often you make new babies. And so what I've illustrated in this slide is the how the maximum growth rate of organisms scales uh, with size at maturity. Again, these are for all for unicellular species. These are all very, very well studied species grown under by many labs under different conditions. And what's recorded here is the maximum known growth rate for all these, every dot's a different species. Everything's normalized uh, using, I guess, a Q10 of, I think, 2.5. Everything is normalized at the same temperature because things do grow at different temperatures and different labs use uh, slightly different temperatures. Almost all the eukaryotes are grown around 20 uh, degrees C, so no big deal there. Uh, but anyhow, they're temperature normalized. And what there's a couple points I wanna make with this plot here, these plots. The top one's for heterotrophs, so heterotrophic bacteria, and these are all uh, unicellular eukaryotes, different lineages ranging from yeast to amoeboids to ciliates, all the way down to dinoflagellates. And then the bottom panel, these are for phototropes, photosynthesizing organisms. So one of the first things you'll notice here is that the, the direction of scaling of maximum growth rate and cell volume is in opposite directions in bacteria and in, in unicellular eukaryotes. In bacteria, the larger the cell size, the faster the growth rate, the faster the cell division rate. And in every uh, eukaryotic lineage, the larger the cell size, uh, the slower the growth rate. So there's an inverse relationship here, positive relationship here. It's not strictly inverse. The slope is about minus 0.2 in a power law relationship in all those different lineages. So as I just said, these slopes for heterotrophic eukaryotes are minus one fifth for Phototrophs, they're minus one tenth. That's a very, very weak scaling in phototrophs. And the cyanobacteria, these are the pro, these bright turquoise slots. These are the prokaryotes of the uh, uh, bacterial world. And these envelopes here, just to put things in perspective, these are just pulled down from here. So there's nobody up in these growth rates if you're a phototroph. Uh, where these bacteria are growing. Phototrophs grow at much slower rates, not surprisingly, because they, they have to make their own reduced carbon compounds, whereas we just exploit them. We already start living with reduced carbon compounds. Anyhow, the slope here is about minus one-fifth, minus one-tenth. The arguments in the literature have been mainly about whether there's a one-third or one-fourth scaling. Uh, these are associated with surface to volume arguments and so on, fractal arguments. I won't go into the, the, the arguments at this point, but the point is the data are consistent with either one of these schools of thought that have been subject to all this debate. I want to also emphasize, and I'll return to this later, 
the data up here for heterotrophs are completely independent, completely incompatible with the idea that the origin of mitochondrion uh, induced a bioenergetics revolution. We'll return to this, as I said, in a second. There's a, at least a few people who still think that the mitochondria, without the mitochondria, we would be able to do anything that we can do as eukaryotes. And you can see that despite the addition of the mitochondria, we can't grow as fast as prokaryotic cells of the same size. So those are the scaling relationships in unicellular species. And there's a lot of unsolved issues here uh, with respect to every all the relationships that I've been pointing out. The first question is, is why do the energetic requirements for growth scale linearly, isometrically? Those are the earlier plots that I just showed. And we I just addressed this in the last question is, these scaling relationships seem to be very, very general across prokaryotes and eukaryotes despite the fact that the cell structure is very different. But now we see that larger eukaryotes become less efficient. The rate of growth per biomass declines with increasing size. And why does that scaling relationship go negative, whereas the bacteria relationship goes positive? Another interesting question to ask from a bioenergetic point of view is, what's the maximum capacity at which cells can bring in carbon and turn it into biomass? The data say that if if you're one cubic micron in E. coli cell, you're never going to, once this is scaled to 20 degrees Celsius, nobody can grow faster, cell divide a cell faster than uh, twice per hour. A cell of this size is a bit bigger than a yeast. The minimum cell division time is two hours. And if you're a bigger cell like an animal cell, the, the minimum cell division time would be eight hours. So there's an upper limit to cell division times that have been apparently achievable by natural selection over time. And what, what dictates those upper limits? And I'm gonna give you a couple of arguments now. For bacteria, the scaling relationship between growth rate and cell volume, we think may be purely a, a physical constraint. And in eukaryotes, the data may fit the Drifter hypothesis. So in bacteria, uh, there seems to be a, a simple potential explanation for why cells get larger, they're able to divide uh, more rapidly. And the simple reason is that more of their biomass consists of the cytoplasmic constituents that enable them to make more biomass. There's a surface to volume issue here. So in bacteria, so bacterial cells are surrounded always with cell membranes, one or two, and then there's a cell wall in here. So there's a good amount of investment in the envelope around the cell. My student, Bogi Trikovic, has, has been studying this over a wide variety of different bacteria. And it turns out that in bacteria, the thickness of the envelope is pretty much independent of the size of the cell. Now, surface area scales with the square of a linear dimension. The volume scales with the cube of the linear dimension. And assuming the cell thickness isn't changing with cell size, then the surface area to volume ratio investment scales as a volume to the two thirds power. Now, if we divide that by the cell volume, now the scaling is, is V to the minus one third. I think I didn't have to use these scaling arguments uh, with, you could just do this with, you know, just imagining increasing this cell in volume, a smaller and smaller fraction of the cell is now invested in the envelope, which is not a productive part of the biomass in terms of making more biomass. So a simple ex explanation for the higher growth rate and larger bacterial cells that are investing proportionally less in cell membrane. Now, you would think that that would even work better for eukaryotic cells as they get larger and larger, moving out orders of magnitude in cell size. But it turns out that in eukaryotes, this math doesn't quite work. And the reason is, is in eukaryotic cells, as the cells get larger, the thickness of the envelope increases. So you're offsetting this reduction in the surface to volume ratio by an increase in the thickness of the surface. And what this does is it results in, independent of the volume of eukaryotic cells, 
about 20 to 40 percent of the cell's energy budget is going into just the envelope of the cell. So this is our first encounter of fractionating the energy budget of a cell into different components. In eukaryotic cells, about a third of the cell's budget goes into the home in which it lives, the cell wall and or cell membrane. I like this result because if you've ever bought a house in the United States, I don't know what it is like in India, but if you, you go out with a realtor to buy a house in the United States and you ask the realtor, how much of my income should I be spending on a house and my mortgage? And they always tell you about one third of your salary. That's the, so I call that the realtor's law. And it's interesting that uh, unicell eukaryotes seem to obey this law as well. They invest about a third of their uh, energy budget into their, their home, so to speak. So we can't explain what's going on in eukaryotes with the, these kind of arguments, but they seem to explain the prokaryotic positive scaling quite nicely. And that, I think, helps us understand why big bacteria are the fastest growing organisms we, we know of. We can look at this in a different way. Let's return to the, uh, the plot I showed you before for cilia. It's the metabolic rate scaling as a function of size and the growth rate scaling as a function of size. You can think of the growth efficiency as the cell division rate divided by the metabolic rate. That's a measure of the amount of biomass you can make per oxygen consumed. And you can see that in ciliates, there's a big difference between these two and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger as you get larger and larger. But here for bacteria, we're plotting these points for bacterial metabolic rates. I showed you some of these earlier in bacterial growth rates and you can see they converge on each other. And so that's telling us that it takes a lot less respiration to make back a unit bacterial biomass than it does to make eukaryotic biomass. So this just sort of hammers home our, our bioenergetic relationships that I just mentioned. Bacteria are much more efficient at growing than unicellular eukaryotes. And it gets worse if you're a multicellular eukaryote, as we'll see in a few minutes. What I've done in this plot, this is the same plot you saw before, but now I've added all these other points out there for multicellular species. Lots of data on crustaceans, mostly zooplankton, but things as big as lobsters and crabs, how big it takes, how fast they can grow, and all these different groups from mollusks to nematodes to annelids. Larval fish is probably a little bit cheating because they're subsidized a bit at birth. Uh, they're given reduced carbon compounds for their parents. So if we don't worry too much about these larval fish, you can see all the data follow a, a, the same sort of relationship we saw in the unicellular species, this downhill slope of minus one fifth. And you can think about this dashed line here is roughly the upper limit to the rate of growth of organisms of different size. That's the maximum natural selection has been able to achieve in any lineage of organisms of these sizes. So now I'd like to do a sort of a back of the envelope calculation and ask how good is biology? How close to perfection are organisms in terms of producing biomass? And we'll do this in a very simple way. Let's imagine, very simple. Let's imagine that the organism consists of nothing but a ribosome or ribosomes. And so all that has to happen to give birth is each ribosome and all its proteins, there's about a hundred proteins or so to make a ribosome. They would just have to make a baby ribosome and they'd be translating proteins. We're assuming mRNAs are unlimited at some rate. And we know the translation speed of ribosomes in different organisms. And we know how many amino acids it takes to make a ribosome. So using that information, we can figure out, we know the translation speed, that's the rate of adding an amino acid to a elongating chain. And we know how long those chains have to be to make the ribosome. We can then come up with an upper bound. This is the absolute upper bound to growth rate predicted under this model. And that's where we are right there for bacteria. You can't get any faster than that. Uh, there's a little bit of noise. Remember we're transferring or transforming data to 20 degrees Celsius and so on, but more or less we're at the upper limit in these largest bacteria. 
the only way you could get better, a higher growth rate is to make your ribosome somehow simpler. Instead of having 100 proteins, if you could figure out how to, how to use 50 or something, which nobody has, you could probably double your growth rate. Or you could, if you could figure out how to translate more rapidly without reducing the translation accuracy, you might be able to go a bit more rapidly. The important point is that bacteria are close to the level of perfection conditional on having to use these clunky ribosomes to make new biomass. The upper limit is lower for eukaryotes because ribosomes are bigger, there's more proteins and the translation speed's a bit slower. So we still have this huge gap in here. You can think of this as the growth rate deficit. You can see that unicellular eukaryotes are just not as good despite being ordained with all these mitochondria and making all our ATP, we're not as good as growing as bacteria. Now, earlier on in my talk, I, I told you that the effective population size scales with the minus one fifth power of an organism size. And now I've told you that the maximum growth rate scales with the minus one fifth power of organism size. So by extrapolation, math, maximum growth rates scale isometrically with the fact of population size. You double the effective size, you double the maximum growth rate of your organism. And one hypothesis here, so as we're moving to the right here, we're getting to larger and larger organisms, the effective population size are declining with that sort of scaling. And the question is, what's going on here with all this missing growth rate potential. And the argument here is that that's a consequence of the progressive accumulation of mild growth re reducing mutations as you move further and further to the right. As you move further and further to the right here, the genomes are becoming loaded with all kinds of non-coding DNA, non-functional DNA, and so on. Organisms over here can't resist the invasion of mildly deleterious mutations. Whereas over here, Bacteria can feel almost any mutation that arises in the genome due to their effective population size being around 10 to the ninth individuals. And that helps explain why these guys get to the pretty close to the upper limit of perfection of growth, conditional on the kind of biology we were dealt with in the last universal common ancestor. I have a question in the previous yeah. So um, it's really interesting to see that with increase in uh, the cell size, the the growth rate is decreasing. So I want to know that is it across organisms, like in heterotrophs, if we consider, is it across organisms that with increase in cell size, the growth rate decreases? Or this is also observed in a specific organism, so like intra organism level also do can we expect that if there are variety of cell sizes uh, the growth rate of epithelial cell versus any other cell can differ in a particular organism yeah that's a, an interesting question um th there's several aspects to it so um all these guys are the open data points here these are all unicellular species so it's growth rate of a single cell and usually in a unicellular species, the cell biomass of that cell from birth is growing exponentially. When you hit a doubling in cell size, you divide. So there's no real developmental sort of thing going on in the unicellular species. But then when you get into multicellular species, then the question arises as to how does the growth rate change at different developmental stages? A lot of things like some of these crustaceans have continuous growth throughout life, but they are growing at much higher rates per unit biomass at the earliest stages in life. And they do slow down per unit biomass later. And here I'm not just talking about um, growth of the organism, I'm talking about total biomass production, including progeny production. That, that declines as the organisms get bigger. So this would be an example of perhaps developmental allometry following the trajectory of an individual uh, of different sizes, paralleling the phylogenetic allometry that's illustrated here. Right. Um, now, if you get into 
complex organisms and different tissues and so on, especially with um, determinate growth as in, in mammals, for example, in birds, you go to a certain size, you stop growing. Um, these things start to break down. But these rates here for all the multicellular species, these are actually the rates, the maximum rates. These are for the stages in life of all these multicellular organisms where their growth rate is maximum. So for the adults, this will get even lower and lower. So this is as good as it gets for each one of these species. So hopefully some of those sentences answered some of your questions. Yes, yes, yes absolutely. So just a follow-up question. I just uh, recall that in a mammalian cell culture when we do, so we have these two types of cells that we see, senescent cells and epithelial cells, sometimes when they grow in the same uh, culture. So senescent cells are actually larger. And uh, just by seeing, uh, we sort of distinguish between epithelial cells and senescent cells. So with this concept, I was trying to relate that uh, our senescent cells that do not divide are larger or because they are larger, they have become senescent. So that kind of a thing. Uh, so I was trying to get to that question. Uh, yeah, that's a, a good question. <laughs> I don't think I have the answer even close to that one. Uh, but I mean, it's even a little bit unclear what we mean by senescent cells. I, I understand what you're getting at, but they're sort of developmentally programmed, I guess, to stop growing, right? In many cases. Right. So senescent cells are basically those cells which no longer rapidly divide, but they yeah. have reached a stage where the cells are growing and they're metabolically active, but the right. DNA replication does not happen in them. So right. one of the concepts uh, can be that since the cells keep growing, but division is not happening, hence the cell size gets bigger. But yes, the growth rate decreases in that case. But epithelial yeah. cells, they maintain a 10 to 20 micrometer uh, diameter, and they keep dividing at a higher rate as compared to the senescent cells. So yeah, so I was, the concept remains the same. So I was trying to understand if it happens yeah. in the organismal level as well. Well, it would be interesting to, I mean, in principle, you could measure the growth rates and the the basal metabolic rates of, of such cells. It would be interesting to to compare the two. Right. Thank you. But not not easy, I don't think, for a multicellular species. Yes. Okay. Um, I have another quick question. Yeah. Maybe it's a bit philosophical. So uh, if I understand correctly in this argument, uh, you are assuming that somehow the growth rate is a proxy for fitness. Is this an obvious thing in the wild? I understand in a laboratory experiment, this would be the case, but in a natural environment, is that established? What's your view on that? Yeah, no, that's a good question. Um, my view on this is that these are the maximum growth rates of any life stage in an organism. And for the unicellular species, th this is it, right? You, you need to, this is your fitness. You're a cell and you divide. You want to do that as, as quickly as possible. Uh, for a multicellular species, it gets more complicated because you start out at a small size and, and these are the maximum growth rates at the smallest size. Um, but you get larger, you may be confronted with size selective predators and all kinds of other things that might start to play a, a more complicated ecological role. Um, I think it's open for debate, but I would like to think that natural selection is always going to favor energetic efficiency. And for these unicellular species, that's all you're doing with your energy is making more biomass. But, and, you know, I'm open to other ideas and other suggestions here. Okay, thanks. Yeah, um, so I should check with you guys. Uh, would you like me to stop now? I've lost track of the time. I think I've gone for maybe an hour and a half. I've got a bit more for this particular talk. I can always weave it in tomorrow, whatever you'd like. It's up to you. If, uh, if it's a good point to stop, uh, this is okay, or if you want to go on for other... Minutes. Let me uh, pop out of here and and try and well, I can just advance. Let's see where we are. Okay. Okay.
Let me give one more slide and I'm going to fold. I was going to talk about uh, the mitochondrion. Probably uh, that's irrelevant to this program, I guess, because that's where we make our ATP. But let me let me just finish. I'll, I'll break after two more slides and I'll fold that part into my talk tomorrow. Because I, I think I've gone for an hour and a half. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Let me just follow this up. So what I've shown you here is uh, I'm, I'm showing you that in terms of growth efficiency, things really go downhill. You pay a price for being a larger and larger organism. And I tried to explain this with respect to the drift barrier hypothesis. And this is just a pure cartoon version. It's roughly how I think the distribution of, if you think of all the mutations arising in an organism, they a, a 10 to the zero, that's a one, that's a lethal mutation. These are deleterious mutations with weaker and weaker effects. And in a bacteria, this is roughly how I think this distribution looks. This red line, that's the drift barrier. So if a bacterium has effective size of 10 to the ninth, then the drift barrier is 10 to the minus ninth. And anything to the left of here, selection can't deal with, can't see. And anything to the right of there, selection can promote if it's good and remove if it's bad. In a bacteria, there's hardly anything to the left of this quantity here. By neutral mutation, there's really almost no, no such thing as a neutral mutation. The only thing I can think of that's truly neutral is if you're in a non-functional region of the genome and you switched an AT bond to a TA bond, those would be energetically equivalent. I'll talk about that tomorrow, the cost of making nucleotides and amino acids. But in multicellular species, two things happen. The drift barrier moves over to here. This is a big multicellular species of uh, effective size of 10 to the six. So the drift barrier moves over. So by definition, more and more stuff is in this blue area that natural selection can't touch. But in multicellular species, our genome is just bloated with non-functional DNA. So this whole form of the distribution shifts over here. So this is just a cartoon version of showing why I think one can make an argument is that you get into larger and larger organisms, smaller NE, you shift to this situation where there's a lot of mutations that natural selection can't see. And so I, I think the final slide for today is this one, is the cost of multicellularity. I've shown you before the number of molecules consumed uh, for cell division for ciliates. So ciliates increase from this size to this size, different species. The metabolic rate follows this line here. And uh, starting back in my ecology days and, and continuing uh, to fairly recently, we've done a lot of work on the energy budgets of different species of cladocerans. These are microcrustaceans like Daphnia that live in every open freshwater uh, body in the world, lots of different species. And we can grow these things from birth to maturity. We know how much it costs to make an egg. We can calculate uh, the amount it costs to grow from one point to another and so on. They go through instars and we can do this throughout their entire life. And so we've also measured respiration rates in these guys, oxygen consumed. Uh, by the time total number of oxygen molecules, in, in this case, to the time of maturity. And here's data points for them. And I'm just comparing these with ciliates. And there are some species of cladocerans that are actually smaller than the larger ciliates. So there's some overlap in the size range. And this is just an extrapolation of where the metabolic rate would, how the metabolic rate would scale in these guys if they were just sort of bioenergetically equivalent to extended ciliates, but they're multicellular species made of, oh, I don't know, um, maybe 100,000 cells or so. Um, and what you can see is they have much higher metabolic rates than expected if they were unicellular. 
So I think this is a measure of the cost of multicellularity. It's the cost of maintaining, you know, a much more complex infrastructure. You can, of course, do things as multicellular species that you can't do as unicellular species, but it, there's a price to be paid, and that's about a 10 to 100-fold increase in the metabolic cost of producing biomass. So that's where I, I think I probably should take a, a break here. You probably need a, a break more than I do at this point. And then I'll, I'll fold in uh, for tomorrow. I'll talk about how this relates to the evolution of the mitochondrion and its energy producing effects. And, uh, but I also want to talk about the cost of building parts of cells and so on and, and breaking down the energy budget into its different components. So I'll stop for now. If there's any questions, I'm happy to entertain them. Questions? Um, just a point of information. What did you mean by the envelope of a eukaryotic cell? Uh, the envelope of a eukaryotic cell would generally be just the cell membrane. And so Unless it has a wall. If it has a wall, the wall would be included too. So you, basically what you're saying is that the plasma membrane thickness is about yeah. the same for all eukaryotic cells. No, it increases. For the single cell? The thickness of the envelope scales positively with cell size. So that would include a cell wall, things that have cell walls. No, uh, uh, without cell walls, why would the plasma membrane uh, thickness increase? Oh, the plasma membrane itself is not likely to increase much. The only way that would happen, I guess, if the fatty acid tails increased. Yeah, so I'm still a bit confused. So if you don't have a cell wall, what is the envelope of a eukaryotic cell and why does it, uh, uh, how does it scale with cell size, if it scales at all? Well, in some cells, there's there's other stuff going on on and, and top of the, the cell membrane. So there's decorations on the outside of, of certain kinds of cells, like haptophytes, and diatoms, things of that sort. So those are all included as well. But for a, a lineage, say a amoebae, it would just be the plasma membrane and then the thickness would not be increasing. Yeah, that's what I would- Not very say. much anyhow. Thank you. Yeah. So so if I understood correctly in the, in the drift barrier hypothesis, a, a crucial ingredient is basically right that we assume that for larger genomes, the fact that there is only one crossing over event per chromosome puts essentially a limit on the effective population size. So but I wonder, now I wonder if, if we assume that, that growth rate is under strong selection as, as this does, then, then the question becomes, I guess, why, why is this a hard limit? You could imagine an organism, right, that, that increases this summer. We could have multiple crossing overs. It will probably require remodeling of the whole machinery that does this. But do you see a, a kind of hard limit as to why more than one crossing over event is not really tenable? Or is this more an empirical observation? Well, it's an empirical observation for sure. Yes, yes. <laughs> it's a really solid empirical observation. But why it's so solid is and general across all eukaryotes is pretty unclear. It's as though, I mean, you have to have generally one chiasmata to hold things together during meiosis, but it's as though natural selection is doing its best to minimize the amount of recombination going on, right? And yet there's a lot of evolutionary biologists argue about you know, recombination and adaptive evolution and so on. But when you look at the data, there really is this hard limit. If there's one biological law in eukaryotes, it's sort of one crossover. You know, sometimes you get two, but you know, never much more than two. <laughs> 
All right. So if you have any so ideas, you know, let me know. <laughs> oh, yeah. Thank you. There are more questions. Okay, Mike, I don't see any more hands for the moment. So uh, if there are any, we will collect them and ask you tomorrow. But thank you so much for the lecture and uh, look forward to seeing you again tomorrow. Okay, same time tomorrow, I assume? Same time tomorrow, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thanks a lot.